Broadcasting from the Shepherd Ministry Studios in Scottsdale, Arizona, this is Shepherd Gathers with Pastor Scott Seidler. Hey, Shepherd family, Pastor Scott Seidler. It is the last and final installment, the ultimate episode of our Shepherd Gather journey this fall here at Shepherd of the Desert. We've been studying the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to these Philippian Christians, and we have traversed far and wide, deep into the text, broad into the world of mission, and uh, we have reinforced for ourselves that as citizens of heaven, partners in the gospel ministry, we have been given a hope we have been given an identity that is precious in the sight of God and instills confidence for us as we walk in this world. Well, today we're going to look at uh, Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to look at Paul's parting words in four movements through this chapter. It's a longer chapter, maybe a little bit longer than we normally tackle in a single Shepherd Gathers episode, but you really can't have one without the other, and so we're going to just mash it all together and finish up our Shepherd Gathers journey through Philippians. I think you're going to find it really, really delightful. Hey, remember that as we go through this study, if you're watching us on Facebook, give us a like, share a comment, share with your friends or family by uh, including this Shepherd Gathers episode on your your newsfeed. If you're on Instagram, you can like us, YouTube, like us. We want to make sure that this ministry, this digital ministry of our Shepherd family gets out far and wide, and you are partners in that effort. So I appreciate it, and I'm so grateful. Hey, let's launch in here to Philippians chapter 4 and uh, look at the first part, really just a single sentence that launches us toward the end of this letter. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, my dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. Paul realizes that the Philippians are buckling. They are buckling under the load of persecution they are buckling under the load of spiritual doubt, which we all struggle with. They are buckling under the load of confidence that this kingdom effort is really going to, to succeed. Paul says something to them that is a very straightforward. He says, stand up. That's uh, literally the word, stand, be established, but stand behind that phrase, stay true to the Lord in the New Living Translation. As Paul walks through his ministry life, what, for some 20, 25 years as a follower of Jesus, you get the sense that there were many, many times where he felt like his legs were giving way, that the weight of the world that was upon him was going to absolutely crush him and cause him to despair. It's one of the reasons why throughout the letters that he writes, one of his favorite images is to tell those with whom he is working, for whom he has been sent, to stand up. I want to flip back, if I can, with you. If you're in your Bible, you can even put a little note here at the beginning of chapter 4. See Ephesians chapter 6, because Paul uses this word stand in the New International Version translated several times. Just listen in as I read these uh, verses from uh, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with the feet, your feet, fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. 
Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert always, and always keep on praying for all the saints. You know, as Paul writes those words to the Ephesian Christians, we are going to hear several echoes of those words here in Philippians. The first echo is right here in Philippians chapter 4. Stand in the Lord. Um, don't buckle. And I guess that would be my opening uh, salvo for you. What's causing you to buckle these days? And think broadly, not just of a, a specific circumstance. I'm having problems here or here or here. Think broadly. Am I buckling because I doubt? Am I buckling because of headwinds, persecution? Am I buckling because I am not confident that this road I'm on is the right road? Um, buckling comes not just because of specific circumstances that confront us day in and day out, but oftentimes, I find at least, that the real source of buckling, <laughs> of losing our footing, is something that's a little bit more categorical. We're not confident in God's daily provision. The persecution that we feel and we see on television, in the news media, that we might even hear from family and friends at time in our Facebook feed, is a little overwhelming. What is that source? Confront it. Speak into it and say, I am going to stand even if you squish me harder. Right? Uh, that's what Paul's hope is for the Philippians. He says, you are my joy and crown. You know, Paul was buckling. I mean, Paul was just a human being like you and I. And at any point in time, as we would read maybe in 2 Corinthians 3, we are crushed. Uh, we are uh, pressed down but not crushed. We are persecuted but we're not abandoned. He goes into this litany in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 of all the things that compress him but do not destroy him. And I think the two things that we learn here as Paul talks about the Philippian church being his joy and crown is a twofold way of looking at the stuff that compresses us. On the first uh, side of things, the Philippians in this present moment are his joy. They are providing for his physical well-being. They are providing for his emotional and spiritual well-being by sending representatives from Philippi to Rome in order to visit and spend time with him. They are adding joy to his life. But secondly, Paul says, you are also my crown. And whenever we hear about crown or, or, or something like that, we're thinking about the future reward we have in heaven. Paul understands that this Philippian church is one of the jewels in his crown. When God says to him, well done, good and faithful servant, this will be, this Philippian ministry will be one of the reasons for, for that acclamation of well done, good and faithful servant. In other words, Sometimes, in order not to buckle, we need to focus on the joy that is provided for us by God in the here and now, the community of faith, the encouragement of other believers. Sometimes. Sometimes we've got to be able to look past the here and now to the crown of life that will be rewarded to us for just sheer grit and faithfulness in these days. In the absence of anybody else saying, hey, great job, Scott, you did it today. You served me well. In the absence of that, we have to put ourselves in the perspective, in the picture of eternity and hear God say those words to us, well done, good and faithful servant. So as you begin to buckle, that you would find joy in this study of Philippians, that you would find confidence in the crown that's coming your way. And then we can get into the rest of Philippians chapter 4. Let's, let's read a little bit further. Now, I appeal to Euodia and Syntyche, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. 
Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. You know, as I've asked you uh, and many of you have sent to me your favorite verses from Philippians, I think I just captured about 90% of you. This section right here uh, is uh, chock full of memorable Hobby Lobby verses you can uh, put on your refrigerator, you can uh, set on your nightstand. Um, these are the places where we receive encouragement from the Apostle Paul. But, you know, one of the greatest threats to the Christian church is not the persecution that happens outside of us, not the internal doubt that we face day in and day out. Sometimes the greatest threat to the Christian church is the friction and antagonism that Christians show toward other Christians. Whenever I study a letter like this, or Ephesians, or Colossians, or whatever, one of the letters of Scripture, Paul writes in propositional terms oftentimes. What that means is, is that he's writing straight statements of doctrinal truth, facts, logical argument, linear flows of thought, all this kind of more literary style of writing, letter writing style. Um, but one of the things I always keep in mind, and, and when I'm preaching, I always try to uh, bring forward is that behind every letter, there's a story. Um, while the narratives of the New Testament may be comprised of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts as they tell the storyline of what happened from the beginning of Jesus' life to the end of his life, then from the resurrection and ascension through the book of Acts, the life of the early church, those are called narratives. But letters are a different genre of, uh, of writing, a different kind of writing. Nevertheless, there's always a story. There's always a backstory. Uh, maybe you heard that uh, if, if you were a big fan of uh, Pixar's A Toy Story, you know, with Andy and Buzz Lightyear, there's a new backstory coming out in the foreseeable future, and it's going to be the backstory of Buzz Lightyear. How did Buzz Lightyear become Buzz Lightyear? It, it could be similarly asked here, how did the Philippians become the Philippians that Paul is writing to? What's going on um, as the videotape is rolling in Philippi? One of those things that's going on is that these two dear ladies, Euodia and Syntyche, are having a little bit of a spat. And whatever spat that is, it's not your everyday spat. Um, it's something that is disrupting the quality of partnership that the Philippians enjoy with one another and that partnership upon which Paul is depending. By name, he has to say to them, dear ladies, let's work harder to get along. Well, that's the backstory of Philippians, but I, I remind you that there's another backstory going on. And that other backstory is a story that goes back way early in the life of Paul. Somewhere, I think, in Acts chapter 16, 17, Paul and a friend of his that was as dear to him as Euodia and Syntyche are to one another, a man by the name of Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement and it caused a split in their partnership. The church somehow was deeply affected by that. And I think as Paul gets along in years, he's becoming more aware that maybe, maybe in that spat that caused the split, he was maybe somewhat at fault. And whatever happens, he does not want for Euodia and Syntyche to experience the same kind of split. You see, these are real people. And while Paul is writing one of the most um, argumentatively logical letters of the New Testament, it is rich in emotion, rich in relationship. And we never forget that the truth of God that we contend for 
um, involves people that we love and that love us and that annoy us and we they or them, we them they. So I just want to encourage you to internalize this little call of the Apostle Paul on these ladies and their contextual friends and partners in Philippi. Be reconciled to one another as God has reconciled you to himself. If there's a relationship that in your life has become strained, um, unstrain it, right? Um, repair it. Make every effort, especially if that relationship is anchored to a common Christian faith, whether in the church or in your Christian home. Well, Paul goes on to say, beginning at verse 10, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me now that I was ever, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with little or plenty, for I can do everything. Oh, here we go. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. Let me just stop there for a second. There's a, there's a golden oldie, or an olden goldie, as uh, uh, I just heard on the news. Uh, Bernard Longer was saying, it's an olden goldie. No, Bernard Longer, professional golfer, it's a golden oldie. Anyhow, neither here nor there, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let us be clear, right? This is a classic verse taken out of context, and it is something that is on every 15-year-old soccer player's uh, bedside. It is something that maybe gets put on a, uh, a little bracelet that goes onto your wrist. I believe we had one of our uh, congregation members at the very least say to me, this is my favorite verse. It gives me hope and confidence each and every day. Well, let's talk about the kind of confidence that comes from this. The kind of confidence that comes from this is the confidence that says when spiritual uh, difficulty is staring me down, I know that the spirit of the risen Lord Jesus Christ at work in me will give me the courage, confidence, and tenacity, remember that word from early on in our study of Philippians, the tenacity to push through. I want you to understand that while this verse is somewhat circumstantial, it is not um, uh, exclusively circumstantial. That is to say, if you stub your toe on the side of your bed at night, um, this is uh, not a verse that you use when you have to get up in the morning and you don't really want to go jogging because your, your big toe is purple and blue. I, I don't mean to be crass, but I'm just saying this is not that verse. This is the verse that you quote when you go to Thanksgiving dinner and you're going to see those family members from the other side of the political divide and you, you not only are frustrated with them politically, you see their political point of view as being a spiritually deficient one <laughs> and you have a spiritual judgment for that political point of view against them and yet you say, Lord... They are Syntyche, I am Euodia, I can do this. I can be a source of spiritual reconciliation as you expect me to as your child. If you're a minister of the gospel, if you're one of the pastors that watches this shepherd gathers, you know that sometimes there is a sense that you do not have all you have. You lack the income, you lack the family support structure, you lack the, the, the support of the church council, the board of elders. You may lack all these things, and yet you still have a word within you that you can speak. And Paul was able to do that even in the want of his life. And you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. That's an appropriate use of this verse. Um, but when you are about to kick a field goal, from 47 yards with two seconds left on the clock, um, you can certainly quote this verse to yourself, young high school football player. Uh, it's the bottom of the uh, ninth inning. There are two outs. 
Um, you are down by uh, uh, one run, and there's one runner on the base, and, and you are, are playing softball, and you are swinging for the fences. Uh, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. That's true. I'm just saying this is a little bit more spiritually sensitive, not so much worldly, circumstantially sensitive. So remember that. Quote this verse. Set it to heart. Memorize it. But use it rightly. Uh, let's keep on going. Verse 15. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I'm graciously supplied with the gifts you sent with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now, all glory to God our Father forever and ever. Amen. Um, I am going to be uh, a little bit um, greedy uh, here. And in this verse, I just point out to you that the transaction of resources in the church does matter. You know, every time we have a Shepherd Gathers episode, I uh, invite and ask, I appeal to you for your financial generosity to this Shepherd ministry. I'm going to do it again right now. As we come to the end of this fall 2021 season of Shepherd Digital Ministry, at least through Shepherd Gathers, I would ask you to make a financial gift to our Shepherd family. There's a lot of ways to give. You can go on our website, shepherdaz.church. You can send a snail mail check into our church office at 9590 East Shea Boulevard, Scottsdale, Arizona, 85260. Um, there's a lot of ways to uh, provide a financial offering. And it is important that you do so. Let me back up and say it is important that you do so, period. But if you have concerns about the intensity or tenacity of my personal appeal to you, then let me let you off the hook without letting you off the hook. As we approach the end of this year, um, at least here in America, I know that for many of us, um, our financial resources, what with inflation and the stock market and everything else, have increased significantly. Not for everybody, and I'm sensitive to that, but I know that for many of us, our resources at the end of this year may be quite different than what they were at the beginning of this year, the end of last year. I want to encourage you to give generously. Remember that in the heart of God, he esteems the care of the alien, the fatherless, and the widow. If you are not bent to give to our shepherd congregation, that's your choice, but I won't let you off the hook with being generous in some direction. A give to a local food pantry. Give generously to an adoption and a Christian care center for those who are going through an unexpected pregnancy. Um, do something for the um, special needs community, the March of Dimes, the United School for Autism here on our Shepherd campus. They're doing great work for the sake of those who are at risk in our society. Friends, I will never let you off the hook when it comes to financial generosity. It's one of my most important callings as a pastor. Jesus said you cannot serve both God and money. Paul has no problem here in Philippians, both thanking them for their generosity, but also spurring them on to greater generosity. And here's what I want to say in conclusion to this little section. If you ever think that this pastor is being greedy or, um, or too intense, for your financial support of our shepherd ministry, let me let you off the hook without ever letting you off the hook. Don't give to shepherd, but in the sight of God, be generous financially to other places of charity, of social welfare, of community need. Join me in that. And how much should you give? Let me challenge you at this on this as well. 10% of your income, give that away. Just give it, count it as much a part of your budget as anything else. Just give it away. 
doesn't have to go all to your church. Give it away. Be honorable in the sight of God when it comes to your financial generosity. Okay, let's all take a deep breath now. That rant is over. I'm returning to the text, and it's going to be super duper fun because we've got only two more verses left. Philippians chapter 4, verse 21. Give my greetings to each of God's holy people, all who belong to Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you their greetings, and all the rest of God's people send you greetings too, especially those in Caesar's household. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Well, um, Paul's typical ending, right? Be generous with God's people and, and, and then I greet you. I cannot miss what I think is a huge wink from the Apostle Paul. One last bit of encouragement to this Philippian church that was birthed in persecution finds itself still tenaciously engaged in the struggle against those who are persecuting it, both inside with their personal doubts and, and, and fears and outside because of antagonists that are besetting them. I just cannot escape this last final plug where Paul says, I greet you as, along with other brothers and sisters and also those in Caesar's household. Paul is in prison. He is being held under the guardianship of the Emperor Caesar. And the shocker of it all, my brothers and sisters, is that there are believers at the highest ranks of the Greco-Roman government. They are in the household of Caesar. And Paul is there with them. And for all the antagonism and persecution that is going on in the Philippian church, Paul's last bit of encouragement is to say this, you are not alone. And the very people that are joining you in this struggle are living right under the nose of the emperor with me today. The struggle to bring this world to its knees and confess the matchless name of Jesus Christ. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is, the, is Christ to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, verse 11. And that is happening in the very seat of world power in the heart of, in the heart of Rome. You know, in um, the last several years, one of the most encouraging things that I saw uh, came uh, from a friend of mine. His name is Pastor Paul Teske. He's a pastor down in uh, Dallas, Texas. He does revivals throughout the world. Uh, was a pastor in uh, Westport, Connecticut at St. Paul's Lutheran Church. And uh, Paul is a former military officer, and he is connected up with um, some pretty amazing people in the life of this American country that we live in. And uh, one of the uh, things that we always relished from Paul was every so often he would send a picture with Vice President Mike Pence. Because Vice President Pence held a weekly Bible study in his uh, vice president's office. And he would invite various pastors from around our country to uh, pray with him, to encourage him, to focus their eyes on the Word of God. I always appreciated Vice President Pence for that kind of Christian faith and how he brought that faith into the very seat of power in our nation's capital. It was good to have a Christian vice president um, helping lead our country. And Paul would send pictures, uh, you know, Paul in his collar, and there he was with Vice President Pence. And I, I think of the uh, relationship that uh, Pastor Paul Teske had with Vice President Pence when I think of this little section here. Um, Paul may not be talking to the emperor Caesar every day, but one of the things we know is this, is that Paul gave a witness and testimony to the emperor before he was released and continued on with his Christian ministry. The emperor heard the gospel of Jesus Christ from the lips of the apostle Paul. And while that may not have changed the trajectory of history immediately at that point in time, what we know is about 200 years later, 250 years later, the Roman emperor 
empire made a decisive turn to make Christianity the religion of the realm. It started here, and it starts with you as well. I know we are set against so many things, and so many things are set against us. But all religion starts locally. It doesn't start on the news. It doesn't start in the, in the seat of government. It starts by a faithful disciple situated wherever they are situated. In Philippi, in a Roman prison, in a house in Scottsdale, in uh, somewhere across the world. And it starts by you as a partner in this gospel, speaking the matchless name of Jesus Christ, pointing to what he did on the cross, what he accomplished through that empty tomb, and how now he is seated at the right hand of God until all other competing loyalties are brought into submission to him. And then the last day comes. The crowns of life are handed out. The book of life is read from. The names recorded in there are recited. And eternity begins. And that's where I leave you tonight with the hope that the Philippians hold, the hope of eternity. Thanks so much for uh, tracking through this uh, letter. I hope you've enjoyed it. Feel free, and I encourage you, go back and listen to it all again. Read and reread this letter. Make this letter the uh, book of which you are an expert. Uh, make it your book, this book called Little Romans, because it leads to a higher calling, a, a higher vision. And that's where we set our eyes. That's where our citizenship is found. I'm Pastor Scott Seidler. Thanks again for joining. Thanks again for sharing and extending this digital ministry. We're going to take a break here of about, well, a couple of months, and uh, we'll be coming back after the beginning of the year in January 2022, and we're going to start a new study. Don't really know what it is. Haven't decided yet. If you've got any thoughts, feel free to email me. You can connect with me here at shepherdgathers at shepherdaz.church. Would love to hear from you. And as we uh, close out this study, would you bow your hearts and heads with me? in prayer. Lord God, for the Philippians, for the Apostle Paul who wrote to them so long ago, and for every heart that has read this letter over the past few months, thank you, God, for the way you constitute your Christian church, how you call people from every part of this planet to follow after you in partnership for the sake of the gospel. Bless us, O oh God, with a tenacious face faith that stands up against all antagonists, all naysayers, and speaks confidently that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, and to that all people say, Amen. Well, Shepherd family, have a great rest of your uh, 2021 year, and we'll see you again after the new year.